on right now. Yeah, this is on. Yeah. It's connected to the XD display if you want to try it again. You're not feeling anything? Is it turned on? No, I don't see your hand. I don't see your hand. Get closer, get closer. There you go. Okay, it looks good, looks good. Can you see it though? Okay, cool. Try to like, connect it again? Something? Like, like XD score? Yeah. You can, you can put it back down to our Oh, there you go. That makes sense. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, we can okay, cool. Let's stop it now. Okay. Okay, that's it. I want to test one last time that it works or not. It does. It does. No, 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 no. Not that. The, uh, no, pick my No, it's okay. But this is fine. Oh, shit. Can you just pick that? Okay. Let's, let's feel fabric. Hold on. No, it's 929. Hurry up. Like, like, like. Not even the mouse is moving. Okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, okay. okay. Just one last time, just try it out with the XD display or something like that. Okay, that's it. We have the video already. That shows the user experience. And then we just have the video. Okay, it's connected now. Yeah, I just connected. Yes. Oh, oops. <laughs> no worries. Oh, hey, Jeff. Good, good. How are you? It's, I know. And, like, I didn't realize that the sign is tiny. So I only saw it this morning, and I was like, oh, my God. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. You guys are in the front. Uh, there's a bag with your name on it. Um, and as soon as we get going, I'm eventually going to get you guys up on the stage to say a quick, very quick few words. And then we'll get going. Cool. Sure. Totally. Thank you. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Yeah. Oh, the spreadsheet. Uh, to the form. Yeah, to the form. Um, What's up? Just that whenever we can start, on, start we should probably start. We are going to start. I okay, just need no, to just get no, this. No, we don't need to do first time. Just
test test. Test test. <laughs> I can't get this. Test test. Test. Yeah. Uh, okay. There. Can you hear me? <laughs> Through my mask. Okay. Cool. So do we check check All right so very strange to try to speak through a mask uh, into a mic. Those of you who are going to be presenting today, make sure you test this out uh, because I am, it's literally in the mask. It's the only way for people, I think, to hear me. So make sure you do that test. Uh, welcome to a very special Collider Cup. It is our first time back out of quarantine, right? So welcome back, everybody. Um, Turns out our faces are not out of quarantine, so we do require people to wear their masks while we are in here. Um, so welcome back, everybody. This has been an incredible semester, very unusual experiences, trying to figure out what the new social norms are. Do we shake? Do we do the fist bump, arm bump thing? Uh, I think, it, oddly, it creates an environment for us to, to meet, because that mutual social awkwardness creates something to talk about, right? As we're all trying to reinvent uh, the future social behavior, right? So the Collider Cup, I'm gonna transition to talking about that, is about also creating the future uh, through technology and through innovation. And so um, I want to hand it over to Melissa, who is going to tell you about how today is gonna go and uh, introduce you to the agenda right now, right? Cool, yay. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Um, yeah, so I have just a few notes here, but um, cause it's been a while since I've spoken in front of an audience, so I have to remind myself. Um, but yes, the Collider Cup is SCT's all-star showcase of the best student teams from fall 2021. And we are really excited to welcome you back to this showcase event live and in person. Um, in total, more than 850 students from 120 unique majors have enrolled in these courses, representing all six undergraduate colleges and schools on campus. So this semester, uh, we are excited to partner with both Erupture Angel Network and Berkeley Angel Network um, for the Collider Cup, along with Pair VC and the House Fund. Um, Prizes will be offered from all of our partners, so thank you so much for your support of our students. And um, I will now have the judges and our partners um, quickly come to the stage for a very brief intro from each. And I think we have a judge who also just came in. So um, yeah, let's, uh, if you guys wanna come on up, and there's, I think, another mic there. And so yeah, judges and partners, we wanna come up to the stage real quick, and we'll, we'll intro y'all. So come on, come on up, come on up. Sounds good. Is this, is this on? Can you hear me? Good? Thumbs up? All right. Uh, I'm Chris Gorog. I'm EX2000, uh, and uh, I currently run a company called Headline. Uh, we make merch for various companies from Urban Outfitters to YouTube and whatnot, and there'll be a $200 gift certificate to our website. 
for the winner. So I know that's important to all you guys. Excited to be here from the Berkeley Angel Network, and I'll pass it to Kai. Hey, I'm really thankful for all of you guys to be here today, especially like in, you know, this morning. Um, so my name is Kai. I'm the co-founder of Rupture. And at Rupture, we're building a diverse community of founders, builders, and angel investors, uh, essentially anyone who are really interested and, and passionate about the startup role, right? And um, we want to be able to help the founders to basically connect them with the correct resources um, through our angel networks. And um, our amazing team here, Yuvia and uh, Val, um, <laughs> say hi. And also our core, uh, core uh, members, Ben and Alex over there, have really been a long time supporting friends of uh, Erupture. Um, if you guys want to learn more about uh, Erupture, go to our website, erupture.co, and then you can basically submit a, um, a applications and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, thank you, I appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Oh, is this working? Okay, awesome. My name is Danielle. I'm an investor at Pair VC. Um, we focus on help, or we focus on partnering with uh, companies at the pre-seed seed stage. So pre-product, pre-market fit, pre-product market fit. Most of our partners have previously founded companies before, so we like to say that we really help the companies that we partner with um, get from zero to one, raising their seed or Series A round. Um, some of our investments that we've made in the past, um, you may know, are DoorDash, Gusto, and Branch. I'm um, really excited to be here and excited to see all of your pitches. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Onda. This is my fifth year back, is it? Is this how long I see? Fifth or sixth. So thank you very much for having me back. Um, my name is Jay Onda, like I said. Uh, I've been on the corporate innovation and venture side for the last 10 years, but most recently, I'm supporting a, a nonprofit called the Extreme Tech Challenge, which is the world's largest uh, community and competition for purpose-driven startups. And so out of context, this competition here, we had 3,700 applications coming from 92 countries, um, all for tech for good startup companies. So double bottom line, venture backable companies that are doing good in this world. Um, I'm also a founder of the Sundial Foundation, which is a nonprofit venture philanthropy, investing in uh, companies that are solving for equity, um, sorry, equity education, employment, and environmental stewardship. So thank you very much and good luck everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Wallace. I'm a co-founder of two startup accelerators, one based here in Berkeley called The Batchery, and another virtual one called Silicon Valley in Your Pocket. Work full-time. My full-time endeavor is just working with startup founders from around the world, um, helping them move their businesses forward, get funding, et cetera. I'm an LP in a couple of funds as well, and I'm a hustle. I'm from 92. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Farmer, honored to be here. I represent, uh, along with Jeff, uh, the Berkeley Angel Network. Um, I started the Autism Angel Group last year in the middle of the pandemic to help neurodiverse founders and for neurodiverse solutions. I've been in digital health a long time and also I'm an LP for several funds and happy to look and hear you about your startups today. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Andrea. I'm currently a partner at a venture fund uh, based in Asia, but we invest in globally. We target crypto and blockchain. Um, so the fund has been uh, established since 2018, and we invested in a lot of layer one blockchain, such as uh, Polkadot, uh, Solana, uh, Avalanche, uh, Oasis Lab, to name a few. Uh, so ve very happy to be here. All right, thank you all. You guys can sit back down. Thank you so much, round of applause. And I just have one video from our partner who unfortunately couldn't be here. Hopefully. Hi everyone, my name is Aditya Iyengar and I'm an investor at the House Fund and a former participant in the Collider Cup as well. We are a pre-seed and seed stage fund focused on investing in Berkeley's boldest startups, including the likes of Flexport, Anyscale, and Superhuman. We are thrilled to continue to partner with Sket to identify and support awesome student-founded startups. As our prize, we will be awarding accelerator interviews to the top three companies that place in this semester's Collider Cup. Best of luck, and we can't wait to meet you. All righty, so that's, that's from afar. Okay, so I'm um, just going back here real quick, and oops, actually I already had that up. All righty, so real quick, I'm just gonna go over what the agenda is for today. Um, so I'm just get my notes back up. Alrighty, so here's how it's gonna go. 
Um, so we are going to begin here with um, pitches from five of our student teams. Uh, they're gonna be doing three minute pitches followed by three minutes of panel Q&A and feedback. And then we'll also have live voting for you, our audience, uh, which is important uh, because you guys will be voting for the team that's gonna win the People's Choice Award. So be ready to participate after each pitch and there will be um, a QR code that'll be up here, um, also a link. Um, fortunately, the link's not a very pretty link, but hopefully the QR code will work for you guys and then you guys can do live voting after each pitch. Give you guys about like 30 seconds or so, so definitely get your votes in. Um, once we get through the first five, uh, we'll take a quick bio break and 10 minute stretch. Then we'll all reconvene, come back in, do the final five set of pitches. And um, then the judges will go convene and, and figure out who their winners, the winners are for today. And during that time, we will have Ken Singer again back on the stage uh, announcing the winners of our SET teaching awards. Um, and then uh, we'll have Michelle Lee uh, our academic programs manager at SCET, um, talking about our certificate of entrepreneurship and technology, along with a preview of our classes for the spring. So students, you might want to see see some of that to see what SCET is bring, coming up with in the spring. Um, also, Ken Singer will speak about our study abroad program in Portugal for summer 2022, which is exciting that we're able to travel abroad again and bring this for our students. So that's exciting if you guys want to hear about that. And finally, be sure you're back at around 11.20 a.m. where the winners will be announced. We'll do the awards, we'll get some pictures, and that'll be it. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna call up the first team who's presenting, which is from our class, Alternative Meet with Ann Fletcher. Um, so that is Team Hotco, I hope I'm saying that right. And Ann, if you are in the room, if you wanna give a wave, you can. Um, there she is in the corner, thank you, Ann. And I will get that. It's tuned up. A lot of us have been in this situation. See if I can get you another one because right now I have just that one. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, definitely get you guys. I do want like any warnings about how much time we have. Good morning. Uh, we're representing alternative meat need finding and product development, and here are our insights. A lot of us have been in this situation. You're hungry, don't have a lot of time and energy to cook or eat, but want to feel full regardless. So what do you do? Prepare some instant noodles, of course. It takes three minutes. All you need is water, microwave, and boom, a meal. But there's always something missing. When we talked to frontline workers, we found that they were constantly looking for snackable, savory, and filling options to eat while on the go. Constantly on the go, and we only had like five minutes to eat our meals every time. While instant noodles were a go-to food option, the protein component was consistently lacking, and not everyone had the time to customize it as they liked. With Hakko, we can fix that. Thanks, Max. So let's take a deeper look at the market which we operate in. When shoppers are looking for shelf-stable snacks with high nutritional value, they'll often end up in the energy bar aisle, which is currently dominated by some big players like Cliff and Kind. And these are great options, but one can only eat so many sweet cookie-type bars. And this is because they are lacking the protein-rich, savory components of many feel-good foods like seasoned meat and eggs. So we ask ourselves, how can we use alternative meat to create more snackable options that combine the best of both of these worlds and potentially create a new grocery aisle of its own. So this is our product, which is a twist on the classic instant noodle. Uh, it contains an actual protein that makes it fulfilling as well as convenient. The meat alternative is stored in the bottom of the cup along with the flavor sauce. Based on our research, we'll be able to work with food scientists to, make, to create a fermented protein that is stable in room temperature and preserved within the sauce. The real star of the show, however, is our instant protein. We plan to develop a shelf-stable protein option that will not only be used for instant noodles, but can be used for other foods, such as pasta, and, and it's quick, nutritious, and available. 
Our business model will have a high-touch customer relationship in the beginning, so we plan on distributing 250 units to Berkeley students and basically measure their interest through surveys and uh, scorecards. Customers will also be redirected to our website where they can buy the product directly or in bulk. In terms of our roadmap, we first hope to uh, work alongside food experts at Matson in uh, refining our ramen product as well as uh, perfecting our add-in fermented alternative meat. Uh, after launching the ramen, we hope to expand our alt meat into other um, ready-made meals such as pastas and soups and eventually into selling the meat by itself as a shelf-stable protein source. For our competitor landscape, we looked at other shelf-stable food options, including Cliff Bars, which is a snack option, and traditional ramen brands like Maruchan, and upcoming vegan noodle brand, um, Big Noodle Bowl, which both don't prioritize nutrition. Hako fulfills the unique qualities of both being filling and nutritious, qualities which have historically been missing in the shelf-stable food competitor landscape. Furthermore, Hako's price falls perfectly in between Maruchan's and Big Noodle Bowl's price, making its pricing very competitive. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> All right, great job. Okay, so turn it over to the judges for, let me just cue this up, uh, three minutes of Q&A. You can also sort of wrap some feedback in there, too, since we are a little pressed for time. And... Yeah, just pass the mic between just y'all and... Just a question uh, for the team. So if I understood it correctly, one of the challenges you guys face is actually developing the alt meat product itself. Yes. Have you guys thought about partnering with an existing alt meat and having the innovation be the ramen plus the alt meat? Um, we actually plan for the um, meat to kind of be the star of the show. It's kind of the idea is that we're transitioning from... Well, basically the noodles will be the vehicle for which the alt meat will be um, kind of delivered to the market. However, we plan to kind of develop our own alt meat um, in the meantime, that will eventually become kind of the shelf-stable meat option that's like, convenient and available for people to use. Uh, yeah, and we've partnered with Madsen um, in order to actually roadmap this alt meat that we're going to create. And we have, or we're in the process of creating this in-house recipe um, using techniques like fermentation so we can keep it shelf-stable and um, also have it at relatively low cost. I have a question. Um, how did you get to your price, and what are the unit economics? Yeah, so the noodles each would cost around the pack of noodles would cost around seventy cents. The um, the sauce would cost around thirty cents, and the price of the meat would cost around. Oh, sorry, my bad. The meat would cost around seventy cents, and then the um, the the pro. Oh, sorry. The protein, 70 cents. The in-house sauce, 30 cents. And the instant noodles, 25 cents. So the ultimate cost would be around $1.25 to build. And Matson helped uh, determine these prices using previous, previous market research on companies developing similar proteins with that. Yeah. Can you go to your competitive slide? This is more of a general comment not than specific to yours, but you know, as an investor, we see tons and tons of pitch decks and things. One thing I personally don't like seeing is we have all the checks, our competitors have some of the checks. Or guess what, we're in the upper right quadrant. Those are kind of predictable. Um, are you familiar with a petal chart? Does that mean anything to you? Petal, like a flower petal? Okay, it, it's a, it's a, it looks like a flower petal, and it just is a different way of depicting your competitive landscape. Again, it's subjective. I personally think it's a better way of thinking about it. So when I saw this slide, I immediately started thinking there may be a better way to depict how you differentiate and what is your kind of unique position relative to the competition. So it was just, a, again, a general comment, but uh, something that I'm probably going to have a similar feeling with some other decks. So, Thank you so much. happy to share information on it, and our, my contact information can be given out. So. Um, I, I, yeah, I think following up on the positioning uh, style, I, I think you can also highlight that um, your product provides like healthy and because you only touch on the like the entire meat, but we all know that ramen, it also has soup, it also has noodle. So to make a good ramen, uh, those components maybe you can also touch about. 
And uh, during the whole pitch, I, I think uh, maybe next time you can also emphasize like the flavor, maybe collecting uh, questionnaires or first batch of user. Um, because when, I, I think, because, for, uh, as a, because I, I don't really eat red meat, so when I choose a product, if I just want to eat a uh, like non-meat non product, I may not choose ramen. So if I choose ramen, there must be some other reason that I, that I really want, so yeah. Cool, so well we're out of time, but thank you, great job Team Hako, thank you. All right, judges, if you could do your scoring and for folks out in the audience here, if you could do your voting, give you guys a little time for that. Also judges, I think there's a mic, there should be two mics amongst y'all. How, how did that happen? Okay, well, we do need to find that, so. <laughs> All right, and on deck. Wait, are you good? Yeah. All right, votes are in. Next team, treat me well, come on up. Okay, well, here's the this if you would like. Well, this is forward backwards. Right? That's forward backwards, yeah. Okay. All right, so we're going into Amazugal. If Shomut or Gert are here, if you want to give a wave. We've got Gert, awesome. All right, so let me get into y'all's slide. All right, y'all ready? Okay, here we go. That's, that's up there. Hold on. You could you could see him frantically moving. <laughs> oh no, I think he I think he was doing a reset. It should, is it, I think it's on now. Hello. Yeah. Okay. It's on now. Okay. All right. Don't worry. I stopped the clock. You're good. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. Go for it. Hi everyone, my name is Diana and for the past 15 years my mother has been suffering from high blood pressure and she's been in and out of the hospital twice already this year because she keeps forgetting to take her medication on time. Luckily she does have my father helping her but I do fear for her future and a lot of people are facing similar problems. I do pass you on to Brian now. We all treat me well and we are helping Diana's mother getting healthier and her insurance company getting wealthier. So what's the problem we're tackling? Medication and adherence, which is to say that you do not take your treatment as prescribed by the doctor. This problem is affecting 70 million people in the US only, which costs around $500 billion to health insurance companies each year. So our solution is the following. For the user, you scan your prescription, you have a health schedule and reminders to take your medication. All these with a, pre with a predictive user interface, your <laughs> behavioral economics, and you get access to a community of people sharing the same pain as you do. Our business model is straightforward. Health insurance companies use Treat Me Well so that their users get less sick and so they can save money on medical costs and increase their profits. We're tackling a $14 billion uh, addressable market and our pricing strategy is the following. On the one hand, we have uh, $24 per user and per year. And on the other hand, license fees to our integration partners. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, for the competition, you know, there's plenty of apps already trying to tackle this issue. But we think that Treat Me Well is just better because, you know, uh, for health insurance companies, uh, we'll actually like, provide uh, predictions from the data. So they will be able to predict, you know, before someone gets sick. Uh, for the patients, you know, as well. Uh, we'll be able to collect data and, you know, through like behavioral economics, gamification, will help them get healthier and actually take their pills. Uh, that's our financials, so basically we want to reach $100 million uh, by year five. 
So we're asking for $2.5 million uh, that will get us uh, cash flow positive in 2.5 years. And uh, you know, we think that we can uh, achieve like a, a good return on investment for our investors since uh, we'll do like maybe a trade exit with one of our partners. That's our development plan, uh, three phases, basically. The first one is a pilot test uh, here at UC Berkeley. It's already on the way. Uh, you can see a uh, Warren right here. Uh, from the ship, uh, we want to develop an app for the high pretension, then we'll expand to other insurance companies, uh, you know, for partnership with, for example, Accenture or Microsoft that has already been uh, working uh, with uh, health insurance companies. Uh, and finally, we want to uh, expand to other diseases because we want to help as many people as we can. All right, uh, so that's the dream team, uh, six people from seven different countries, highly motivated to try to make the society healthier. Thank you very much. All right, judges, if y'all want to take it away. Hi. Um, interesting. There's a lot of products on the market. I didn't see them all listed in your competitor uh, slide. So, for example, there's smart pillboxes, stuff like that. Tell us a little bit more about how you differentiate with uh, behavior and with adherence. Yeah, so during our market research, we actually had a conversation with Anker, who designed one of these smart pill boxes for uh, insurance companies. He kind of tried taking a similar method as us, but what he said was hardware, it was really hard to get going and to actually make it effective and reach the most people because it's not, it, because it's contact based. And so, because since we're an application and since we have two sides to the insurance and to the, the user side, I believe that we can go further than a hardware can because we're software and that's non-contact. You can work on that a little bit more, just saying, okay? You need to convince us that it's a major differentiator outside of anything else that's available in software. You can do it, you just have to work it a bit more. So I just did a quick search as to, you know, what are the causes for this, right? <clears throat> And as Kathy pointed out, you know, pillboxes are one solution. There are other software solutions as, as well. So one of the interesting things that I would love to hear from you guys is if you identified one particular thing, like forgetfulness, right? That's one example. There are some other ones here too, patient lack of understanding. So for example, if you translated it into different languages, would that improve? If you showed a use case of that, that in your research, you showed that it went up by 70%, then I might say, wow, that's really interesting. They've identified one use case where they really, really pinpoint it and the other apps are missing it. So just a suggestion. The, the thing I thought um, is along the lines of, I think, Kathy's comment. So I, haven't, I had older parents, they're both gone now, but my mom in particular never took her medicines at the right time. But I don't care what app you could have created for her on an iOS device, an Android device, an iPad, name the tablet, there's no chance she could have used it. So it, it's a challenge if, if you're targeting mostly older people. It's not necessarily all older people, but just something to consider is the user experience. Who's the actual user? Yeah, so just if I could remark on that, we actually put flexibility as the core part of our solution. So even though it appears as though the app is a central solution, there are abilities to get notifications through like SMS, email, stuff like that. So even if a user, like older users, don't have the application downloaded, there is a possibility for them to get text messages and log their pills that way. So like we said, because we're talking to users, we realize that flexibility is the most important. And then I just have one comment. What we did is we actually talked to some of the people who struggled to pick up the phone because it's something that we don't have in our hand 24 seven. So one of the things they actually suggested is if there could be a phone call coming in because then it rings up longer than just a notification. So they physically have to go there, pick up the phone and then they could be reminded that this is something that they have to do. Cool. Great jobs all the time I have for Team Well, or treat, treat Me Well, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Welcome. Well done. All right, judges, if you could do your scoring. And for those in the audience, here's your code. And also, we are missing a mic. If y'all could please also just check around your seat and your bags. There is one handheld mic that is floating in the room and needs to find its home. Yes, thank you. This is for you guys. Don't lose it again. <laughs> 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 
All right, cool. Votes are in. Next team. I love it. You're here. All right. This is Lulu Lemon Haptic Team from uh, Data X. Um, Derek, are you in the room? If you can give a wave, there he is. Thank you so much. I'm very excited about this, I do have to say. Um, okay, so let's get your. Thank you. One last, really quick. So the, the way the industry uses this, does this right now is they send out swatches, right? So it'd be interesting to look at, like, what does it cost to send out a swatch? Like a dollar, right? So could right. you send out swatches to every single possible lead and actually do it for less than it would cost to put your thing out there? That would be bad for the business model. Of course, yeah. Of course, if you show the reverse and you show that this is way better and you increase average order size and all that, and you say, we get rid of swatches, you just revolutionize the industry. Those are the two sides. Right. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I, I just want to add one point. Um, I, I think our business model is very cool. And one direction I think you can uh, look into is maybe the metaverse, because uh, your product and technology actually naturally fits into that. And there are a lot of metaverse e-commerce coming up. So that's a direction you can take a look. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And I guess bef at some point, if you guys want to come and feel it, I guess you can. Or Yeah, okay. Yeah, totally. Oh, yes, thank you. All right, cool. Great job, guys. Judges, if you could do your scoring, please. And for the audience, here's your code so you can do your people's choice. Where's my phone? All right, and the next team that will be up is Nova XS Biotech. If you guys want to start coming to the stage from um, Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship Bootcamp. All right, cool. Hmm? The slides are, oh, I, I think I, I got the slides. I received them, yeah. Okay. Are you, is it too? Okay. Hmm? Um, and if Gigi's here, if you want to give a wave, there's Gigi. This is from Berkeley's class. Awesome. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, are you? And then you gotta go, yeah, go back. Cool, you ready? Okay, all right, here we go. Hello everyone. So let's start from a very easy question. So how many of you here is afraid of needles? Majority. So right now, imagine that you have to inject yourself since age seven for a thousand times for three years and that was what I have to do to my sister, Kathy. So at the age of seven, Kathy was having growth hormone deficiency, and she had to constantly inject herself for three years. And that is a problem we're solving right now. We have seen new drug delivery has never changed in past 50 years, but new drug discovery has changing every single day. And that is a problem we're facing. And why it's important, we're solving the medication non-adherence and that is due to three main points, low patient tolerance and also low accessibility, lack of monitoring. Low patient tolerance is because patients are afraid of needles. And low accessibility is that most of the injectable drugs, you have to go to hospital to do any injections and the healthcare provider has to be there. But we are seeing a trend that telehealth is actually bringing hospital into patients' home. That means we are able to see the doctor in their home, but not for the medication delivery. Lack of monitoring. Most of the patients are missing daily dosage because they are constantly forgetting. So these are the problems we're solving. And how? We have created a tech solution that is already patented 
a needle-free injector that is able to inject the medication without any needle and deliver into human body. And that is able to increase efficiency by five to 50 times according to our research. Also, with the app, we're able to increase adherence because we're doing real-time therapeutic monitoring. And the app will be the one platform to inject and also track the all injection data with treatment reminder, injection frequency, medication dosage, and also medication temperature. Because mo most of the self-injectable, like insulin or growth hormone, it's temperature sensitive. So we want to make sure that when people are injecting themselves, it's efficient and also it's safe for them. So let's see some exciting news, the traction we have got. So we have already filed two utility patents in both US and China, and we also signed three preclinical partners in Baylex Stem Cell Innovation, Juvenile Therapeutics, which is a unicorn in the entire Silicon Valley. And we also got into M Hub Baxter Accelerator, who is helping us to do all of the manufacturing and prototype renovation. And NHSBR grant is providing us $30 million of grant is searching for new drug delivery, such as triple negative breast cancer and also Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And our scheduled pilot run is in Mount Carmel Hospital, which we have just visited in Chicago area yesterday. So our go-to-market strategy is right now targeting rare disease such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy because that would put us in an accelerated track to get application of master file, and that will take around six months. And we are in talk with several partnerships like Kaiser Permanente and also risk-taking healthcare providers like PTC Therapeutics. So our business model is dividing into three revenue. First, before the master file application, is the B2B licensing, and then B2B2C hardware sales. And because we are having the software function, we're able to subscri subscribe the service with our consumers. And also we're able to get re reimbursement from insurance company. And it's every single year, $800 to $1,000 per user. And here's our financial projection. In five years, we're aiming towards 98 million total revenue. And the use of funds. So right now we're raising th 3 million seed run and in past two months, we have already raised 50% of soft commitments to achieve our massive fire clearance. And here's our team. We're ranging off board advisors and also fantastic talents from different industry and area, ranging from Medicare and also medical delivery, and also bioengineering in UC Berkeley department. Okay. All right. and, and that's it. All right, judges, three minutes, ready? Yep. Okay, just, go for it. Just a quick comment, uh, great presentation. It looks like you've got a lot of really great traction going on. The only comment I would have was on your slide at um, the use of funds. Um, can you go back to that real quick? Just sure. out of, you know, again, it's probably a general comment, but when a startup tells me they're gonna use the money for product development, marketing, operations, it's kind of useless. I think every startup's gonna use money for that. So I'd rather see you focus on what specific milestones are you gonna achieve with whatever raise you might be doing at the moment. Great question. So here's our milestones we're trying to spend our money on. And here is, so we're going to do the safety test in order to achieve the massive fire clearance. And that is the stage why we're raising this money. And as for a prototype, I actually have it with me. So we have already achieved a prototype that's able to inject the medication without the needle. And here is our version one prototype. And that's why we want to improve this prototype into a master file approval and also able to collect the data. And right now we are improving in our Chicago area manufacturer. Great answer. This may be a better slide than the use of funds uh, <laughs> description, but great answer and good presentation. Thank you. Okay, I know you're great at pitching because I heard you pitch a couple of weeks ago from a car. So I am very impressed with that. But can you tell us what your biggest fear and risk is that you see? Because everything is aligned quite well, but tell us what that is. Right. So I would say the biggest risk in our company will be facing about how long we're going to get that master file. Because getting master file, that means when we can deliver this technology into patients' hands. And when we're doing 150 consumer research, Every single one of them is asking us, when can we get this product? And when can I use this product to my children who need constant injection? They want this product, and they want this product desperately. So we want to get this to them as fast as possible. And that is think, our biggest challenge right now. So that is why we are targeting Duchenne muscular dystrophy, 
that rare disease track is getting us as fast as possible as a fast clearance in FDA approval. Can you talk a little bit about your technology? Now, I understand high level, but like, is it reusable? Is it disposable? Are there cartridge based? How yes. does that work? So let me use this as an example. So it is reusable and because we are having cartridge. So every two days, we're changing one cartridge. That means we're having a subscription revenue from the cartridge itself. But for the device itself, it is able to sustain for three years. So that means for three years of injection, people only need to buy one, but they need to constantly buy cartridge from us. And that is required by like sterilization and also safety of the patients. Thank you. All right, great job, Nova XS. All right. We're voting. Here we go. People's Choice, get your votes in, please. Judges, please score as well. And uh, Veriply is on deck if you guys want to start coming on up to the stage. And are we there? Cool, that works really well. I am missing my thing. And Alina, I think you took my little clicker for, for slides moving forward. Yep, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> what? I'm sorry? Oh. Did you vote? Did. Oh. Hmm? Oh, it's done. It's done now. We already, we're, it's, a, it's quick. <laughs> All right. So we have startup acceleration from Mark. So Mark, if you're in the room, if you want to give away, we've got Mark over here. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right, we have our solo presenter. Yeah, respect to Alina. It's hard to do by myself. My, my team is wishing everyone an amazing day. They're all the way, 5,000 miles away in Denmark. So doing this alone today, but it's OK. Awesome. So good morning. My name is Danielson Sipper. I'm the co-founder of Veriply. We are helping companies quickly discover, investigate, and prevent invoicing errors and fraud in real time. So last summer, I worked as an internal auditor at a Fortune 500 company. During a duplicate payment audit, I was shocked at the prevalence of transaction errors and lack of preventive controls across the industry. Whether you know it or not, errors and fraud are buried in your invoices. They're like the proverbial needle in a haystack, and manually sifting through thousands of invoices a month is far too expensive and tedious for companies. To tackle this problem, large enterprises are deploying expensive out-of-the-box solutions and entire fraud departments. But for SMEs, who comprise the majority of our country's GDP, these solutions are far too expensive. Additionally, their lack of controls leaves them two times more vulnerable to AP fraud and billing fraud. Through our customer discovery, we learned that transaction-heavy SMEs are looking for a low-touch and affordable solution to validate their invoices. And we are changing the game because we are providing these SMEs with a low touch and affordable solution that will validate their invoices in real time. And here's how we're doing it. Uh oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll go back to the slide. Uh, oh, I have to request. Okay, access. there we go. That's okay. Oh, okay. Um, so, we are developing an AI powered invoice anomaly detection system that will cross validate invoices and audit those invoices in real time. So, our software, our software will allow the companies to cross validate the invoices, verify the legitimacy of vendors and make sure that every single invoice that's coming in is 100% correct. So by looking at the transactions of the companies, we will be able to flag high-risk invoices and allow the companies to rectify these errors before they cost them. So that was just a little video, a demo. Awesome, so our business will feature a freemium model. First, we're going to release a free plugin on the QuickBooks Marketplace that will track basic invoice anomalies, such as duplicate payments and pricing errors. For SMEs, this will lower user adoption and allow us to upsell our paid version, which will feature strategic procurement tools and advanced vendor verification alongside AI-powered contract compliance. 
So um, to make this product a reality requires competencies in machine learning, B2B tech, and internal auditing. And we bring just that. We're a team of student founders from UC Berkeley, Copenhagen Business School, and DTU, bound by a shared passion to expand the use cases of workflow automation for SMEs. We are currently in the development of our plugin, and we are excited to release the plugin at the end of Q1 of next year. So I come here today with a simple ask. If you are someone that has felt this pain firsthand, or perhaps interested and excited to help SMEs, I would love to talk to you after the pitch. Thank you so much. And you can scan this little QR code to check up on our progress and learn more about what we do. Thank you so much. Actually, just in case, yeah. Yes. Um, quick question. Um, what data sets are you using? And are those proprietary to you? Or can any other company also get access to them? Yes, so our data. Um, so we are actually in a partnership with PwC in Denmark alongside a company called Sixth. Uh, they're providing us with the large data sets that we're using to train our machine learning models. Um, and just a caveat, this is one thing that we found is one of, the mo one of the hardest things for developing this product. And so we're really trying hard with this free plugin to be able to keep the, the amount of data that we need to run these analyses at a minimum, while at the same time training these large-scale machine learning models that is going to be for our paid version that will feature the strategic procurement tools and the uh, contract compliance. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Awesome. Thank you. Can you, can you give a specific example of what that looks like? like it, I'm, I'm sure it's not like a duplicate line item that looks exactly the same, right? But, but as an end user, like how do I know that it's working or sure. that you know, the false positives are? Sure. I really wish that the, the demo was able to be seen. But no you um, you know, if, you're, if you're a company, just imagine you log into um, you know, your, your QuickBooks user, for example. Um, this will be a free plugin. You will have a dashboard, and whenever an inbound invoice is coming into um, into your company, we were gonna we're gonna go ahead and create a risk rating. We're gonna scan and we're gonna track them against the historical invoices to find an error, and also to allow you to to provide you with insight on how to fix that error. So to imagine this, um, if you're looking through all of your invoices. Lots of companies, and especially the Fortune 500 I worked at, they had over 10,000 invoices a month, and they all look the same when they're coming into your system. But imagine if you could go into your system and instantly find those, uh, those errors and not be, not be able to um, scan through everything and spend so much time and resources making sure that everything's correct. So that's how it will look like. Um, hope that answers your question. Well, what, what does an error look like? Yeah, so an error, an error comes in all shapes and sizes. I've kind of become a fan of them doing all this research. But for example, duplicate payment. A lot of the times, there's a duplicate payment. For instance, the supplier sends you an invoice for $100 and then sends it again for 101 Your system will not pick that up. But our system will be able to look through and scrape all the metadata to make sure that, and cross-validate it to make sure that this is a duplicate. Additionally, pricing errors are very common, and they're hidden inside the, the actual invoice. So they're very sneaky, and a lot of the times, they're actually non-intentional. So as a QuickBooks user uh, and somebody who deals with thousands of uh, invoices a month, uh, there's a process, of course, for ex post facto figuring out what the errors were, right? So you have right. an audit, either quarterly or annually. It would be interesting to know from your research yes what that actually costs companies. So it's not 100% of the fraud, but it's some percentage that's right. versus what it would uh, cost after using a product like yours. That's right. That's right. That's a, that's a great question. And we're really trying to make sure that we're showing them that we're providing value. But uh, through our research, we found that SMEs, on average, for each fraud case, they, they're losing up to $8.3,000. Um, on a bigger scale, this is costing them millions of dollars per year. Um, but every single company is different. Um, the company that I worked at was losing over $10 million over three years. So it comes in all shapes and sizes. But what we want to do is we want to be able to, for this product to show value instantly. And the way it will show value is by lowering the, the time that they need to scan the invoices. And over time, as we accrue all the errors, that's another way for us to show the value. That, hey, Veriply is saving you thousands of dollars this month. Um, that's kind of how we're trying to demonstrate that value for companies. Thank you. Great job. All righty, awesome. Well done, Daniel. Real quick for our voting for People's Choice and judges if you can do your scoring as well. 
Um, so while we're doing this, um, we're going to take a very quick little bio break. Um, set that was, uh, and then we're going to finish up with the final five presentations along with learning about um, uh, study abroad and then the Certificate of Entrepreneurship and Teaching Award. But um, so please vote. And I'm literally going to put on the timer five minutes for a quick, quick breather. If you, or if you just want to stand up and stretch, we will start back up after five minutes just so we can keep this running. So five minutes begins now. Thank you. Test one, two, test, test, test. Session. Yeah. I think one thing that we were also thinking of was maybe expanding this. Like, let's say if we do get extra and we're super accurate and stuff like this, and we can print with like a full body experience where you can try it on yourself and feel it on yourself. 
but it's complex enough to get some of the fabric, so that's why we're sticking to just that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For now, yeah. Yeah, do you wanna, is it working? Uh, it's not set up. It's not set up. Okay. For the next break. All right, perfect. Yeah, thanks. Que hasta después voy al rato. Thank you. All right, if Team Menta Abigarta wants to start coming to the stage. You're here. Awesome. Great, great, great. Can we set the microphones down? Yeah. I've never used before. Can we use both mics? Yes, I just got another one, which I'm excited about. So one check, 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 check. This is where I would bust out with the song. <laughs> So I'm going to start like, no, okay, that's not how I'm going to Hi. Is my, is my voice okay? Can you hear me? This is so weird. Check, check. All right, we're just getting one more microphone here to the stage, and then we're going to get started. Check one, two. Check, check. Do you want this? Oh, you got a mic. Okay, I think they're doing it. So, yes, this is Team Menta Abrierta. If Shuo or Christina is in the audience, if y'all want to give a wave. I'm not sure if they're here, but I know they're... I think they overslept. Hi. Hi. All righty. Judges, are we ready in the front? Yes. I think we've got one, two judges that are getting ready. All righty. We've got five more awesome teams. So also, folks who are in the, in the audience, be ready for those for people's choice. Okay. All right, I think we're ready to go. You guys ready? Yeah, whenever right. you're yes. ready. All right, here we go. Do you have the clicker? Okay. In the last 10 years, India's IT industry grew by over 200%. This exponential growth was due to a competitive advantage in services, which were still too expensive in the US. In 2022, the new IT is mental health. Services are still too expensive and inaccessible, especially for minority communities like the Latinx. There are uh, professionals who can provide affordable services, but they live in places like Chile, where the cost of living is only 70% of what it is in the US, but therapists make only 30% of what their American counterparts make. Our solution follows India's example and will target the hundreds of thousands of mental health professionals in Latin America. We will start by providing them with online courses on cutting edge topics. Our students will be able to access resources and a supportive professional community. Our growth strategy is based on key insights from coding boot camps. We'll attract more students by connecting them to work opportunities in the US. As we grow, we'll build our own app, which will facilitate mental health access to Spanish speakers all around the globe. Our growth strategy, oops, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is my first time, <laughs> I haven't noticed. Go, go on to the next yeah. slide. Uh, this will be a digital platform where therapists, courses, and all other resources built to support your mental health are never more than a click away. Great. 
Uh, we've already trained over 40 professionals interested in improving their ability to treat one of the most prevalent issues in our community, substance abuse. Our next pilot course will include over 100 people, after which we will launch our first two courses, one for, one for professionals and another that they can use with patients. We've teamed up with leading specialists in this area to build these courses, and we've partnered with nonprofits in the U.S. and in Peru so that we can engage students and also build out these courses responsibly. We are a team of Latinas with experience in data science, education, cognitive science, design, and business administration. We've all experienced uh, the difficulties of addressing mental health in our communities firsthand, and we understand the social and cultural complexities that, that make it so that U.S.-born Latin Americans uh, access mental health r at a rate 50% less than their non-Latin American counterparts. That is why our main marketing strategy is activism. But activism is way more than responsibly sharing information and running workshops for influencers. It's about community building. That is why our platform will be a safe space for patients and their therapists so that they can not only educate themselves, but also interact with each other. We're currently looking at we're currently looking for a first round of seed funding. Evaluated at 95,000, this will fund our operations and development of three more courses. Thank you. We are Mente Abierta. Thank you. Hi, uh, beautiful color of Thank your you. presentation, just st strikingly beautiful. But. Um, so yeah, this is for sure a big issue and there's a ton of mental health companies coming out right now mm -hmm. since COVID started and it's really important because everyone is just sad. Yep. Um, but I'm, I, and I know a little bit about this community. My kids are Hispanic. I was curious if, I, I'm curious about how you're gonna get in front of those with the biggest need, especially those that fall below the social economic line. Could you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? And, you know, access, digital access is one thing, but what about those who, who can't even get there? That would be, just be helpful to understand given your target market. Uh, so the target, the initial target market being um, the therapists we want to educate in Latin America, uh, who do generally have access to uh, media communication and to be educated. Uh, that doesn't really apply to your question, but the goal would be to incentivize them to engage with us in order to connect them to work opportunities in the U.S. And that's where your question comes into play. How do we get people who can pay for therapy uh, to uh, work with these therapists and, or mental health professionals and stuff like that? Um, so in that case, we're hoping to uh, approach institutional partners or just find different uh, versions of work opportunities where trained uh, therapists might be able to fit in. So these could be coaching opportunities or different uh, counselor opportunities at schools and, and things like that. There are also um, informal ways in which uh, people in the U.S. are connecting with professionals in uh, South America, and that is happening, again, informally, and that reduces the cost as well. We might not be able to get uh, services to the people in most need at first, but the goal is to kind of grow with the market and in that way start bringing down prices, not only for the U.S.-based Latin American community, but also for Latin Americans around the world. Does that answer your question? Ish. We yeah. also, like, we plan to have them, like, win in dollars, which is a really big coin. Right? Like, if you compare the South American coin with the dollar today, it's, like, you're winning in dollar, it's a lot more than, like, winning in, like, you were winning any job in South America. So mm -hmm. that way we can like make a path. Uh, they're winning more, so they can do like more pro bono work. They can like help their, their own communities more. We plan mm -hmm. to have like that kind of partnership with them. So like we help you with more money that like, like you deserve to win, but you also need to help us like bring mental health to everyone who needs it. Thank any you. other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the way I view it, content oriented businesses like the courses that you have are typically difficult to scale just because your your scaling is sort of um, hindered by how much content or how quickly you can produce content. So I'm I, my big question is, I guess, how are you planning on generating more content as you continue to build? Well, okay. 
while psychology is a quickly evolving field, uh, the course that we've uh, built first is, for example, in harm reduction therapy, which is still an evolving science. Uh, and for the most part, there's like already third generation therapies for cognitive behavioral science, for example. So the creation of content is not really an obstacle that we've uh, thought was going to be as big of an issue because not only do we have a rapidly changing field, but we also have a lot of professionals who need nuance. And that's where the community building also comes in, where we can factor in things that come out of our community and include them in the content that we continuously build. Cool, thank you, well done. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. For people's choice, if you guys could please vote, that would be great. Judges, if you could do your scoring as well. And up next, if you guys want to start coming to the stage, we will have See We Need It from Deplastify the Planet. Come on down. All righty, we are closing this. All right, so if Matthew is in the audience, you want to give a wave. Did he hear? Did he go? Did he go all the way at the back? Maybe there. Up oh, all the way at the back. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. All righty. Uh, who wants these or both of these? Both of y'all. Who wants this? Okay. All right. Uh, Price-wise, we don't have the data for that, but like from a chemistry perspective, if we um, tailor the, and, and the recipe for actually manufacturing the plastics by choosing the right additives and the fillers. Also combining that with fibers, we can you know make the material suitable for the upholstery uh, applications as well. Yeah, I think the main challenge here in terms of like production and manufacturing would be from the supplier side of things. Like the supplier market is super fragmented and then there's only like a few big players. Um, so that's definitely a big challenge. And then in terms of the go to market strategy, it's something that we would have to see, as in, do we become, you know, high mix, low volume, or are we um, high volume, low mix, selling directly to the OEMs, or do we go down market and have our own product, like a luxury product or something like that, which we could then price higher? So, TBD. <laughs> Great, Good luck. thank you. <laughs> Very cool, and they have more samples if you guys want to feel it. All righty, People's Choice Voting is open. Team Idol, you are on deck if you guys want to start coming down. Five more seconds for voting. All right. So now we have Team Idol. Oh, we didn't have the name of the presenters. I'm sorry, you guys will say your names. Um, from Alex, I don't know if Alex is here. Nope, okay. Um, from our Innovation X class, Future of Industry Startup Lab. And they get their present. Integrating metering data, operational data, and policies in an elegant dashboard that is shared with all the stakeholders so that they can promptly fix any inefficiency they can see, they can observe performance trends, and price the airlines accordingly. We, we plan to sell this software to the airports. They would try out our plan for six months and then upgrade to a premium according to the features that they wish. They would be able to share the data with all their collaborators. And now I will pass on to Diana. Because globally there is over 8,000 airports, we see a huge opportunity here, especially because our total addressable market size is around $750 million, and IDLE is looking to take 10% of that market. There are currently existing data collection solutions and management tools in aviation, but what we want to do is we want to collaborate with them because what we are aiming to do is integrate the existing systems with our technology in order to push for behavioral change. And this is the key value for our customers today. When we did our financials, we could see that by April 2024, we actually break even and become net positive. 
Today we already have existing pilot running based on the data we've collected with San Francisco Airport. So to actually get to the next stage and get three customers, we need investment of $500,000. And what we will try to do then is actually get the technology in on the airport so we can actually start with the real-time data collection. And our overall goal, or larger scale goal, is to actually start scaling up with further research and development in order to monitor and uh, predictive management. This is our amazing team today. We already have a lot of support from uh, industry experts. Uh, and um, thank you very much. We'll take your questions now. W wonderful, wonderful name for your product. So congratulations on that. And fantastic that you got uh, a pilot with SFO. I know the CTO there, he's actually taking classes here at Cal. Um, I guess my question is around your TAM. It seems a little small. But I will tell you that what you have here are some amazing social metrics for the environment that you can really show on that screen that the environmental value that you give is in another overlay of value to your product. So, but. Uh, just wanted to share that with you. Just a very quick comment, because the TAM was actually based on only the first part of our product, which is uh, starting to uh, build towards monitoring system, but because we do have bigger plans and we're looking at it from different perspectives, the TAM could be much greater, like you just mentioned. Yeah, just to add to that, I, I had exactly the same comment and that you, know, you could extend the product in other areas. I'm actually advising a company that is selling to airports right now and um, it would be interesting to add to your presentation uh, how you plan to go to market in terms of, of getting into the airports because SFO is one thing, but actually getting in into lots and lots of airports is, is, is quite difficult. So if you could be innovative in the partner approach that you took to that, you could really have a, a huge opportunity here. And that's one of the reasons why we, when we realized there's companies such as Asaya and other data provider companies already out there, we don't want to go against them because we are not following their business model. We're looking to partner up with them. And that's one of our go-to-market strategies as well, because they already exist there. They're already collecting data. We just want to build upon that. We would market ourselves as the cherry on top of the cake that's already there. <laughs> All right, judges, you could score. Team Idol. Let me get People's Choice up for you guys. All righty. So, audience, you can vo vote for Team Idol. And looks like we got our next team up. Here's a mic. Here's a mic. That's the clicker. You can take that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Oh yeah, I'll get the slides up in just one sec. We've got seven seconds counting down for the people's choice voting. And that's it, closing it. All right, so now we have Team Karchak from Tech Entrepreneurship. I don't know if Naeem's in the room. Nope, nope, don't see him. Um, so let's get them up and going. This is, yeah, this is you guys. Okay, all right, let me get my timer. All right, you guys ready? Cool, yes. all right, let's do it. Okay, hello everyone. Imagine, you're driving back from San Francisco at night and this light turns on. I'm asking you, when you saw this light, how much will this repair cost you? It's your car, you should know, right? Truth is, most of the people do not know and go to mechanics. But the worst part of this is that more than 79% of the people do not trust a car diagnosis made by a mechanic. And to be honest, I don't blame them. Because according to the US government, about $24 billion are scammed by mechanics every year. And so we ask our, uh, ourselves, what could we do to solve this problem? That's right. And we found out that what mechanics use today, it's called the OBD2. It's this device, it's very complex, and it specifies the problem in very technical terms, so it's useless for most people. 
A company saw that problem and translated those complex terms into plain English. They're called fixed. But if you want to know what you care about the most, the cost of the repair, you got to call in a customer center. It's a painful call. It can take up to an hour for you to know your cost. But we found one very successful company. It's called Carfax. And I think everyone in the room knows it. They're successful because they target the problem fast. You type the VIN number, you got all the car problems. But the thing is, you only got the external problems. And most problems can be in the interior of the car. That's why we developed CarTech. We developed this device that will be able to tell you the internal problems and the external problems and the exact cost of the repair in an instant. So anytime you drive and you encounter that light, you'll just have to check your phone. You'll have the exact problem in plain English and the cost of or, and what people are paying for that problem or for that issue right now. So next time you go to a mechanic, you'll have the security and the bargaining power to never be scammed again. But that device targeting everyone, every people with a car, and when you target everyone, you're really targeting no one. Yeah, that's right. And we got our Trojan horse. People buying a used car because they don't want to be scammed. They don't, and it would be so much, they would earn so much money with like 70 bucks uh, saving thousands of dollars. And we got a plan. We plan also to collect and sell our analysis uh, with the data to the, um, to the manufacturers because today all of the data are lost. So we are asking for that. We're asking you $1.5 million to sell uh, our first 2,000 devices in 13 months. If I were you, I wouldn't miss the car check rocket. Thank you. So, so you actually rebuilt an OBT, OBD2 reader? Like, what's, what's wrong with the ones that are available on the market today? What the, one, the thing that's wrong with the ones available on the market today is that they display complex codes. And if you want to know what's wrong, you've got to do like three hours average of research to actually know what the problem is. Then you've got to look for what people are paying right now. But aren't you referencing those codes and translating it to human, human knowledgeable like, you know, uh, points? What we're doing is car manufacturing, like mechanics, they buy the libraries of what those codes, me codes mean. So you know in an instant what's wrong with the car. But the thing is, it's very complex. We're doing kind of like fixed, putting it into plain English, but also getting data from around ge geographical areas to see how much people should be paying for, for, those, for those issues. Mm -hmm. So you get a notification on your phone exactly knowing what's wrong in plain English so the mechanic cannot scam you mm -hmm. and false diagnose you, and what people are paying for that. So you have the bargaining power when you go. And, and the price? The price is $70. Wow. But we expect to have more revenue, as Antonin said. We're collecting every single data of every sensor in the car. There are thousands. Mm -hmm. All that data right now is being lost. But car manufacturers would really love that data as we talk to them to be able to improve their enzymes and know what's wrong, know what's functioning great, what's not. And we're selling that data to them. Because we're constantly collecting them through the phone that every time you enter your car, it connects to the car tech device. Exactly, exactly. And we're, as Antonin said, we're targeting people buying a used a use car because they don't want to buy a car that's got internal problems that are not seenable from the outside and don't want to be scammed. You can pay up to three, four thousand dollars in buying a used car and being scammed. So I think people and the people we've asked will be willing to pay those seventy dollars for not being scammed and having the, the security that and it's going to work. Yeah, and that's why the used car buyer, our uh, Trojan horse, is because. They are the most in need of uh, this product because they could save so much money uh, with only uh, $70. And when they buy a used car, uh, they could save like thousands of dollars. This, this sounds fantastic. Have you guys demonstrated that this translation process and actually making it intelligible and being able to price it against local car shops, can you demonstrate this actually works? We did. So the thing is, car fixed, they already do it in plain English, so it's doable. They don't have a database where they analyze how much people are paying for it. And it's very rural in a way. It's kind of some mechanics that put this market, like this device out, they call them and then the mechanics tells you what's, what's wrong and how much should you pay. We're doing that automatically. And the thing about what you told me about like the, the, what people are paying, 
we're, we're, we talked to Jerry like a week ago. He's the owner of the biggest car dealership here in Berkeley. And the thing is, most car dealerships, they take trade-ins. So for them, when they have to evaluate the price of the trade-in, they take 30 minutes. And they have to leave the customer alone. That's the point where they lose mo most, most customers. Because you get cold feet, you call your wife, you run out. With that device, they could sell and value the car within the customer. So with the customer, never leaving him alone, and in just 10 minutes. So they're willing to use it, and they will be the ones to offer it with the new purchase car to give a neat image of transparency. You can see exactly what's wrong. And also to save that time when they're doing the trade-ins. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job, team car check. All right, people's choice coming on up. If you guys could vote. And our last team, Empathy, if you guys could start coming to the stage. Oh, dear. It's okay. <laughs> Y'all are good. It's first time back. Who wants or whoever's speaking or? No, no, you're not. Okay. And who's uh, wants to do the slides? Okay. Uh, you just press forward or back. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two, two mics, yeah, okay. just to switch between y'all. Um, yeah. All right, so this is Team Empathy from Product Management. I don't know if Ken Sandy's in the room. He is, there he is, yeah. representing. All right, so without further ado, okay, let me get my timer up. All right, we all ready? Cool, go for it. By the age of 10, I became an, an orphan survivor of sexual and emotional abuse. And that journey to self-acceptance was, was far from easy. But it wasn't until I met an Asian therapist 15 years later that I felt empowered to heal from my past and move forward. Because of our shared cultural understanding, I was comfortable enough to share about my trauma and I only got to this point because I was able to afford $150 sessions, had a flexible schedule, and found the right therapist fit. But that's just not the case for millions of racial minorities. There are 130 million people of color in the US today who aren't getting adequate mental health support. And this is because 86% of therapists are white. It takes an average of 10 to 20 sessions to feel positive health outcomes from therapy. And each session takes about $100 to $200. So clearly, the mental health care system is not equitable for minorities, which is why we created Empathy, a self-guided mobile app for racial minorities to help them feel mentally happier and save time and money when getting adequate mental health support. So here, you can see that you get personalized resources based on your cultural experiences. And from there, based on your survey responses, You can get culturally tailored, clinical grade, and bite-sized content. And this, all of our content is developed by clinical psychologists that are the best in class and that we personally vet. And we also help you build. Okay, go back. Yeah, I'm trying to go back, but it's not working. You might be able Okay, and we help you build healthier habits with self-journaling and mood tracking. Empathy is someone's first step into a mental health journey without having to take 10 to 20 visits just to feel mentally better. So empathy plays primarily in the U.S. self-guided behavioral health market, which is valued at $12 billion. However, this market's growing really fast, 9% every year. By 2027, 
this market will be valued at $20 billion. We know that there are 95 million people of color who need a solution like empathy. This is a market opportunity of $10 trillion. That's a lot. But we know that in order to reach this market, we need, we need to start small, which is why we're focusing on Asian Americans between the age of 18 to 40. And as for traction, we have already been talking. Sorry. Sorry. So why now? There has been a 300% increase in the rate of anxiety and depression amongst racial minorities since the pandemic, with the events of George Floyd and 169% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes our racial minorities' mental health has been negatively impacted, and it's imperative that we support them in this journey to overcoming their trauma. Not only that, by 2045, minorities will become the majority. And now moving forward with traction, we've already been talking to real people, real patients, and real psychologists, and we've also been recognized by Microsoft. And so we are asking for $500,000 in funding so that we can develop our MVP and launch our public beta by June of 2022. And with that, we'd love for you to join us in our journey to making mental health more equitable for everyone. Thank you. Is this a, can I, okay, there. Yeah, hi. Uh, great, perfect, important, really valuable and needed. Um, so thank you for your work. I guess my question is, why do you cut the age at 40? I might be a little older than 40, for example. So we're actually not planning on cutting the age in general, but just for our initial strategy, we want to start small. And for 18 to 40, we're a little bit closer to the age range. We're just a little bit more approachable because of our similar identities and age. But we actually want to grow um, past 40, I know there's a growing market of older demographics who are smart, avid smartphone users um, and would be willing to adopt. Yeah. Can you explain how this targets the Asian Americans and additionally, how you ensure engagement, right? Because this is one of those hard things where there's a lot of resistance and frictions, even, even at the 899 price point, right? Like, as an Asian American, like, why, why is this going to appeal to me? Yeah. Right, so as an Asian American, I believe that we experience very nuanced issues when it comes to mental health, um, as it comes to upbringing. And for a lot of Asian people like myself, it's hard to seem, it's hard to feel heard when you're going through therapy, when, especially when 86% of therapists don't understand that background. So I think in order to stay engaged and make sure these people feel heard, uh, we need to make sure they have relevant content, which is why we're tracking as part of whether or not someone is engaged, um, our, our recommendations, for content actually things that they want to see. And um, so that's, that's one way that we want to make sure we keep our audience engaged by making sure that they feel understood and heard. I think just to add on to that, uh, we aim to build trust through also establishing a social media presence on Instagram and Facebook uh, for our initial um, channel to reach our Asian American communities. Also another metric we wanna uh, look at for success, I guess, and, and engagement with the app is how much users are returning to our learning modules that are generated by these POC licensed therapists and also reflecting on them in the journal entry and like establishing that connection between the two best features in our app and tracking how much they return. Uh, will really feed into um, how we gauge success. Uh, I'll keep asking. <laughs> okay, just 30, yeah, 30, 39 more seconds. Oh, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I can just keep going. <laughs> All right, great job, Empathy. Great name, of course. All right, judges, if you could do your scoring, people's choice, if y'all could vote for your, oh, sorry, for Team Empathy. All righty. Hmm? I don't know. <laughs> yep, okay. <laughs> All righty. So, oops. 
Okay, yeah, actually that's fine. All right, so what's gonna happen now is um, our judges are going to actually step outside of the room into the Garabini Lounge and consult with each other on who they think are our winners today. We were going to be awarding most innovative. We will have first, second, and third prize as well. And then we will also have people's choice. So a lot of different awards, but the first place winner will be getting this overall prize and this wonderful trophy. Um, <laughs> Along, <laughs> along with obviously the prizes, and I do think uh, across the board with our angel investors here, there'll be prizes for multiple teams, um, in within the uh, the winning the winning groups and and beyond. So, um, next up though, um, as the judges are deliberating, so if you guys feel want to go ahead and go remove yourselves, oh. um, and you need to debate, you need to debate. and <laughs> Jesse <laughs> is going to is Jesse there? Okay, there's, you're going to all hang out with Jesse. And um, she'll kind of also help you guys out with the uh, deliberations as well. Thank you, judges. And Ken, and thank you all, yes. And well done to all our teams. So great job, teams. This is hard. We're back. We're masked. It's challenging. So great job overall. So round of applause to all of our teams. You guys really, really brought it today. So congratulations. Would oh, you good. like? So I, I'm supposed. To, so I'm supposed to buy some time here, right? <laughs> Are these things on? God, he keeps he keeps muting them. Okay, there. We okay, go. so um, so I have to buy some time for the judges. Usually, the judges fight over who uh, who wins this thing. So um, I'm not sure how much time we're going to have to well, be, to make. We've got, we've got okay, so all right, so we're going to give some awards, right? Right, Melissa. Okay, so we're going to start with. That Michelle, you want to come up and join us? Okay, so um, we've got the teaching awards for the semester. And Michelle, how many classes did we teach this semester? Twelve-ish. Okay, so that's uh, which is good. Uh, you know, considering the pandemic, and we weren't sure how many students were gonna. Uh, come back. They came back in droves, so we were pretty <laughs> over uh, oversubscribed in our classes. Um, so the we have two teaching awards. One is for the the uh, student coordinator of the semester and the instructor for the semester. And I awkwardly got the instructor award. Actually, I gave myself the instructor award last semester, which was. <laughs> Okay, that was, that was a humble brag, but it was really awkward. Like, um, I think I kind of guessed that might happen because they were so weird about it. But okay, this is your part. You need to announce the instructor uh, award, and we don't know who that is yet. And like, wait, what are you? You, you don't know right before this thing that who won? So um, I kind of suspected, but it was really awkward getting it. This time, um, it's not awkward because um, I know who it is. And it is not me, so it's going to be fun to announce. But we're going to start with the um, student coordinator, the student worker award. And the criteria we used, uh, of course, professionalism, responsiveness was heavy. We wanted to see you know, how students responded. Did they say that the student coordinator um, was, uh, came back with the answers, were, was um, immediate in their responses, how dedicated they were, and how committed to the course? And um, it was tough this year because we got a lot of feedback. Typically, we get maybe five or six students who will say something nice about the instructor or the student coordinator. We got a couple dozen this time, right? I mean, it was a lot more than we, we typically have. And the comments were really detailed, too. So um, that's one way you can tell that um, the coordinator did well is that there are specific things that were in the, the evaluation. So. Uh, with no further ado, Tiffany got it. Now, for the alternative meet uh, class, and this is a tough class to teach because, um, you know, it's, um, I know the way they taught it had some online, some in person, and so to, to coordinate a class that's going to be that complex, can be a challenge, so it's fantastic that she did so well. 
But is she here? Because I thought she was studying for. No, she's not here today, but she did give us a quote. <laughs> so, yeah, she was pre notified. Am I the only person that wasn't pre notified that I won an award? Yep. I feel kind of <laughs> odd about that. So <laughs> she, surprised. yeah, so she, it's not a surprise to her because she got to have a nice quote prepared to talk about uh, her win, and she did a fantastic job. So, congratulations, mm -hmm. Tiffany. When you see this video, congratulations. We wish you were here, but we understand. Okay, the best instructor. And he also knows. This is, that's right. I'm the only person that they did this to. All right, so the best instructor, the way we look at the criteria for that is, again, this is just voluntary. We don't, students don't have to give reviews of, of instructors for this, but um, some choose to. And Mark had some of the most, I think, specific and, and absolutely positive comments about his course, which is the first, it's really the, you know, we did a pilot of this course before, but this is the real, the first time that we really did this as a, a, as a deep course. And um, his, his class was around um, pre-accelerating startups and, and projects that had come out of our courses before. And um, the way that we selected for it was how involved was the instructor in really helping you with the learnings in the class? How dedicated was the instructor in, in helping you and in, in getting to know you and uh, working on your projects? So Mark uh, Serrell, who won this award, he won it for... Come on, up, come on up. And the, and the quote that we, we selected from those reviews, Mark is an extremely passionate and knowledgeable instructor who genuinely cares about the success and well-being of his students. He was readily available for office hours, gave interesting lectures, and imparted not only startup but also general life advice. One of a kind educator, super grateful to have encountered him during my time here at Berkeley. Uh, get it. I, I, I'm, I, I'm partly impressed by the fact that we have students who can write well, because there's always, there's always this you know, reputation that engineers aren't that, well, uh, that good with English, but this is very good. So whoever that was, good job. Uh, wow. Can you guys hear me? Thank you. Well, I point that out because you were an English PhD candidate. I so was that's... at one time working on, what is it, general life advice. Um, thank you, Ken. Um, thank you, SCT. I, it's, it's, in, in fact, um, not, a, uh, not a surprise that I was going to win, but a surprise to hear all these things. Not a surprise because I was pre-informed two days ago. But. <laughs> In fact, it was a surprise two days ago, uh, and it's one of the reasons I'm particularly proud of this is that I know how good all of the instructors at SCET are. And I know partly because my students kept telling me how great the other instructors they were taking courses from were. So all of you here today and not here today, congratulations on really being great, great instructors. Um, and then we don't do this, we don't teach to win awards. But what makes this really, really exciting for me is that it originates with nominations from the students, that it's not something that's, that's top down, that it comes up from the students' uh, lived experience. And um, yeah, so I'm just really, I'm really honored and I just thank all of, all of my students for this semester. It's been a great semester. Thank you. It, it, it. And I, can't, I can confirm that he was surprised because he sent me an email when he forwarded the email that he won. He's like, what? <laughs> so, um, yes. All right. So, thank you. I'm getting old. I can't even. Um, thank you to all of our instructors, course coordinators, GSIs, mentors, guest speakers, judges, staff, everyone who's involved in this semester. There are dozens and dozens of people working in the background making these courses and this program happen. And many of them don't get paid. Uh, they're volunteers, they're Berkeley alums, people who want to contribute to to your growth and your learning. So um, hopefully you, you 
will someday join that group to help the next generation be able to do the things you've been doing um, in your time at Berkeley and today. Yes, and actually to put in a plug there, we're looking for a course coordinator for spring <laughs> for our alt meet class. So if you're interested, uh, take a look at our website. Oh, is this okay? Okay, hi everybody. Um, thank you, Ken. So uh, my name is Michelle Lee. I'm the academic program manager at SCT, if we haven't met yet. And I just wanted to take this time also to thank everyone who was involved in our classes. Um, and I hope that everyone, all of our students and everyone who was involved um, enjoyed the semester. We also just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to our certificate and our classes next spring. So if you're not familiar, we have a certificate in entrepreneurship and technology. You can find all the details of the, um, the requirements and the different tracks and the application process and FAQs and everything on our website. But I just want to uh, go over this really quickly. So all majors are welcome and encouraged to pursue our certificate and to enroll in our classes. So please don't you know, get scared if you're not a technical student or whatnot. You um, apply when you're completing requirements, so you don't have to apply to start it. And you can actually overlap your courses with your major or minor classes too. So it doesn't necessarily have to add time to your degree. There are three possible tracks that you can com uh, complete to earn the certificate. You only have to complete one. And the most popular one is the coursework track where you do our Newton lecture series, which is a one unit class, plus five additional units, so six units total. Um, the startup track is similar, Newton, four units, and then program participation, which is typically um, an internship at a startup. And then our study abroad track is our third track where you would participate in our study abroad program called the Global Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. And at the end, as long as you complete it successfully, then you will earn the certificate. So again, you can find lots Great. of information on our website. Uh, Michelle, yeah. where is that study abroad gonna be? Just Please. Uh, it's gonna be Portugal. So it's four weeks in Portugal on a beach where you will start companies with students from around the world. Uh, it's my favorite program, and so I, I you know, of course, it's because it's Portugal, but um, we really, uh, I think some of the students that uh, take that, or most of them, talk about it being so uh, critical to their, to their development and their memories about Berkeley. So if you, even if it's not that study abroad, if I can just make a, you know, a plug for study abroad in general, how important that can be if, if you can swing it in your s schedules. Uh, there's a lot of financial aid that's provided for it and scholarships provided by alums. Uh, study abroad is so critical. It just is so important for, for you to see how big the world is and how different uh, the world innovates. And it will be important as an innovator to, to have had that before you graduate. So I invite you to, to do that. And if you're interested, come talk to me. We'd love to have you join us. Yes, Ken is um, one of the leaders of that program, so he can give you lots of information. And uh, the past, well, actually, this past summer, we did it online, but we are excited this upcoming summer to be back in person and in Portugal. So um, our, if you've checked out our website recently, it doesn't have updated information yet for next summer, but we will be updating that in the next couple of weeks as we get the, the details finalized, so check back there. All right, and we'll also have info sessions in the beginning of the year, um, so I encourage you to join us for those. So I don't know if you can read this, it's a little bit small, but I had to fit all of our spring classes on this page, so if you are looking for classes in the spring, take a look at our website, again, for more information. There are links to each of the course pages as well with more information about the course and the instructors, if there's an application, enrollment requirements and whatnot. I did highlight the ones in um, the gold color as ones that are, uh, as of yesterday at least, have open seats. So definitely take a look if you're interested. Even if a class has a wait list, feel free to add yourself. Um, you know, enrollment kind of keeps churning all the way through the beginning of the semester. But um, we're pretty excited about some of these new topics and um, encourage you to take a look. Ken, would you like to mention anyone? Yeah, so uh, let me advertise a few of them. How many, okay, this is terrible, because you guys are young. How many of you guys use Facebook? <laughs> oh, still, some of you guys still use Facebook. The older people are, yes. Um, so um, how many of you guys don't like Facebook? Okay, so this is the class for you. It, we turned the word Facebook into a, a verb, 
Uh, you've been Facebooked. Um, even if you don't use Facebook, you're being Facebooked because they own WhatsApp and they own Instagram. So pretty much your entire social media world is somehow being touched by this one company. Their policies and their technology drive so much of your behavior and you don't know it. Uh, to buy things that you didn't know you needed or to do vote in ways that you didn't know you were going to vote or whatever, right? So if you are interested in how some company, whether it is Facebook or Google or some other company, is, has undue influence on your life and you want to do something about it, say build another company that challenges that or does something different, this is the class for you. And it would definitely prepare you, even if you like Facebook, to be prepared to go work for them. So even if you're on that side of the equation, on that side of that argument, this class would be very interesting to help you uh, prepare for a career in tech or start your own company. That's the, the big one. The other one, uh, Deplastify. I think you guys saw the project that came out of that class. Uh, those are the types of projects you'd be working on there. I highly encourage you, uh, if you really care about the planet, this class uh, can help you um, be better prepared to, uh, to lead in that battle against uh, uh, the changes against uh, changes in, in the environment. The last one, I think, is the Health Tech Challenge Lab, the Unleash Innovation. That is, we have two new instructors for that. Both of them are COVID experts. One runs a company that does COVID testing, and the other one um, helps startups uh, with uh, pandemic issues. Uh, and both of them will be co-teaching they're both experts in the, in the science of it, but also they're both entrepreneurs themselves. So if you are interested in starting companies or innovation in health tech in some way, hopefully you all are because it's all headed that direction, that's the class for you. You'll learn some amazing new things at the cutting edge that's rarely taught in school because it's so brand new and also have guest lectures. Actually, in all of these, you're going to have guest lectures that you would not see anywhere else. Any questions on these classes? Yeah, and I'll also mention the Alt Meet Challenge Lab is up there. That is a different alternative meet challenge lab than we offer in the fall. The fall, um, the spring one is a little bit more technical. So the instructor is uh, doing an application, looking for students who have more of a biochem kind of background. So just keep that in mind. But um, Ken, I know you love talking about Newton. Do you want to mention that as well? There's still open seats there. Yeah, uh, well, Newton's always a great place to start. So I think a lot of you have already taken Newton. But, you know, every year it's different. There's always new instruct or new speakers, new topics that are talked about in class. So I, I've had students in the past who've just uh, sat in class through every Newton as they've been here just to, to hear new, new people there. So I w if you haven't taken it, it's a critical class to take because you, you see people who are maybe 10, 20, 30 years ahead of you on the journey. And being in conversation with them to see what they've been doing with their career can be really uh, instructive for you. The other part of that is um, it's great for networking because that class attracts other people like you that you can sit next to and talk about, hey, are you starting a company? I am. Maybe we should start a company together. So if you are looking for co-founders, obviously any of these classes are useful, but Newton especially because there's so many students in there. I would sit next to a different person every day and see, hey, what are you, who are you? What are you doing? Maybe we should do a project together, okay? I know I made it sound like dating, but it kind of <laughs> is, although uh, hopefully your dates don't sound like that. All right, um, Ken, we're, we're about okay. done here. Let's wrap it up. They always <laughs> okay. do this. All right, so I'm gonna head <laughs> it over to you, Michelle. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. All righty, our judges have returned. <laughs> Hopefully all of our student teams are here too because we've got some winners to announce. So I will first start off that um, the winner of People's Choice, thank you all for voting, was, let me make sure I say the name right, is Nova XS Biotech. So congratulations, <laughs> the people voted. All righty, so judges, um, whoever is going to be saying what, if you guys would like to come to the stage for the announcements of Z winners. 
Thank you. Uh, first of all, that was awesome. Uh, I did this 20 years ago. It was my first pitch. I remember how scared I was, and uh, I remember how uh, I took the feedback from the judges uh, probably a little too much to heart uh, all those years ago. Um, but uh, I just want to congratulate everyone that was involved in this because uh, it's not easy, and uh, you guys all did a great job. So put your hands for everyone here. So uh, for the most innovative award, uh, we're giving it to See We Need It. So congratulations. <laughs> Just uh, some really quick feedback. Uh, there were a lot of different views on it. Uh, I personally thought that it is a fascinating research project right now. And if you guys have the, the will and the, the resources to continue moving it forward from a research to a more of a product, uh, I'd love to uh, be involved. Feel free to email me, and uh, it's a very exciting and important uh, solution that you guys are working on. So congratulations. Cool. Um, that was actually really amazing, um, the event. And um, us judges out there was, like, debating. It was, it was like, so... Um, I'm not going to say fun, but it was actually pretty fun. Um, so, are you guys ready? Yeah. So, <laughs> got to be louder. Louder than that. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> so, for for number third, <laughs> we have Idol. And just to comment, there was a lot of debating there. Um, I think that part of the award was given also for the ESG component to it. Mm -hmm. So solving problems in the current startup world where you can have a part of your solution be that you're going to reduce emissions uh, while also making money, that's an excellent thing. So we wanted to congratulate Idle for including that in their pitch. And for the second place, we have Verve ply. Verve ply. <laughs> <laughs> so you want you want to make sure that everybody knows how to pronounce your name. That's part of startup one oh one. So Verve make sure ply. you got it right up. Verve ply. There you go. What's the name? What's the name? Verve ply. <laughs> and for the first place, I think everyone, come up. Let's do it. Louder, louder, let's do it. For the first place, we have Nova XS. <laughs> Get an elbow bump. And so just continuing uh, on it, uh, the judges uh, pretty much unanimously agreed that this was the business that was the furthest along, had the clearest pitch. Uh, and also during the follow-up questions, you did a really great job of directing questions and showing that you were confident in your solution, which is part of leading a startup. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. I do want to say that um, for Berkeley Angel Network and for I think I could speak for all the judges here that for those students who want to be in touch with them, get more feedback, and also for Berkeley Angel Network for mentoring, um, please be in touch with me and I will share that contact information so that you guys can further your projects even more. And that, my friends, does wrap up the ninth Collider Cup. We're back in person, hopefully again in the spring. For all those involved, students, judges, instructors, if you guys could come to the front, we're gonna try and get a group picture as semi-socially non-distance, I don't know, whatever. It's just gonna be here on the front, so if you guys could come down, let's mark this. This is, a, this is a, an occasion for us that we're back. So great job, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Melissa.